This evening we are devoting our subject to the problem of superconscious cognition. In the first place, as we usually attempt to do, at least, we must clarify our terms and understand in common our attitude on these rather abstract matters. When we think of the extrasensory band of human faculties or of spiritual apperceiving powers within man, such as clairvoyance and telepathy, we use general terms which perhaps are not sufficiently precise or exact to indicate the large variety of phenomena with which we are concerned. And when we see a person or become aware that an individual has performed some feat which appears to imply a kind of knowledge or perceiving power beyond our own, it is so easy simply to say, well, I guess he's psychic, or perhaps he's a clairvoyant. And having come to this conclusion, also conclude that we have said something. Actually, we have said nothing. <laughs> Yet, tell them if ever do we require any further um, discussion of the matter. We feel very secure in our discovery and uh, act as though we have really made a pronouncement of importance. Actually, what we generally consider this extrasensory gamut is made up of a universe of factors which we do not know very much about. It is quite probable that one so-called telepathic effect could be produced by any one of a hundred or more causes, all somewhat different, many totally different. Thus, we are actually on the threshold of a world of values uh, which we have not explored, about which we have very little common thinking and almost no common terminology. Under such conditions, it may well invite us to think through some of the levels of this problem this evening in an effort to maybe clarify or distinguish a little more clearly some of the problems and factors which must sometimes become part of our general scientific knowledge because we are moving inevitably in the direction the recognition of an extrasensory band in the human pattern of cognition faculties. First of all, how are we to judge what constitutes the normal sensory sense? Are we sure that we all hear the same thing when we listen to sound? If we all hear the same thing, what is the individual's place in nature who is tone deaf? Unless someone points out this tone deafness to him, he may go along for a considerable time without recognizing its existence. I also know persons who are colorblind. Now, when they are so colorblind that certain complete patterns are eliminated, and they are unable to tell the difference between a green light and a red light in traffic, they generally find out their difficulty rather quickly. But how many degrees of colorblindness pass unconsidered and unnoticed? Now, I told me some years ago that a very great painter, to distinguish about 475 shades of red. How many can we distinguish? Well, perhaps red, vermilion, carmine, 
and all the colors that are not red. How much can we really say our faculties reveal to us? Also, what circumstances might cause faculties to change or be in one way or another distorted? Further than this, how do we know to what degree our sensory perceptions are influenced by preconceptions or by attitudes of our own? We say that persons can develop a blind spot if they do not want to see something. Now this does not literally mean in most cases that they are not able to visually register the object. They may be blind to its meaning, but can they be blind to the object itself? Under hypnosis, yes, definitely. They can be told that a certain object is not there. If they believe what they are told, they are absolutely unable to see the object, although it is there. Or they may be told that an object is there which is not there, and they will be able to see it. Under hypnosis, an individual can listen to music that is not being played and hear it. What is he hearing? The person under hypnotic suggestion who sees the living room rug turn into a mill pond, but take off his shoes and stockings and wade around in the water, what kind of water is it? To him it is wet and cold. But to no one else is it even visible. <laughs> Thus it we know that under suggestions of various kinds, it is perfectly possible to see something that is not there. It is also possible to see something uh, there which has no existence, or not to see something that has existence. The same of odor, the same of the sense of touch. It is perfectly possible for an individual to feel something touching his body which does not exist. If he is told to, and is willing to believe what he is told. Thus our sensory perceptions are constantly being conditioned by a kind of suggestion. If under hypnosis an individual is told that a deceased relative comes into the room and shakes hands with him, he will see that relative come in and will shake hands with that relative and feel that that relative's hand in his own is just as solid as his own hand, yet there is no one there. We know this is true. Therefore, we know that we can be persons not present. We know we can be made to see animal forms or monsters that are not present. We know also that we can be caused to feel or believe that we have journeyed into another place. And the individual can be caused to believe completely and entirely that he has left his living room and has gone to Paris and is in the elevator riding up to the top of the, of the Tour Eiffel or Eiffel Tower. He can be made to see this, believe it, and know it, and can be caused to be so certain of it that no doubt whatever remains in his own mind what happens. We know, therefore, that the sensory perceptions can be influenced. And we know that the principal influencing factor is suggestion. We also know that it is perfectly possible for the mind to be influenced by association and fear. The man walking in the forest sees a broken twig or stick on the path, thinks that it may be a serpent, and immediately he sees a serpent. But in the flipness of a second, a second look assures him that it is not a serpent, so he continues on his way. But for the instant, he is fully <coughs> certain 
that the stick is the serpent he suspected it of being. This phenomenon is too frequently recorded not to be noted and recognized. Always then we have some mysterious power which we generally regard as a suggestion power. This can not only affect our thought, but it can affect our sensory reflexes of sight, hearing, and sound, taste, and touch. The sense of smell, by which we can smell odors that have no existence, simply by being told that they exist. I've also seen and participated in experiments in which color blindness was instantaneously produced so that the individual, under suggestion, lost all color consciousness of blue or red or yellow, and when shown an infinite variety of articles, described them without this color. And for instance, when shown we will say for the moment that blue was eliminated from his mind. When shown an object of the color of green, instantly identified it as yellow. He lost the blue factor. Doing this repeatedly under all kinds of tests, it would not be possible for it to be fabricated successfully. And there was no motive. So we know that these productions of the mind must be taken under consideration, especially when we are further aware that everyone is constantly suggesting to himself something of that which he desires or against of which he has prejudices or about which in some way or other he does not have a completely neutral and therefore factual attitude. The second thing that then we have to also consider is in addition to this factor of suggestion, the degree of perception interference which we have in ordinary problems of observation. The individual today perceives upon two levels simultaneously. He perceives factually and he perceives psychologically. He sees two ways at the same time. He sees what there is and he sees what interests him. And these things are two different factors in many instances. If the mind, hastening on to a desired perception, seeing what it wants to see, moves along through a series of non-desired circumstances, these are passed with indifference. There is little, if any, conscious recognition that these things have even been seen, and the mind hastens to embrace the object with which it was interested or concerned. Uh, the old story of Sherlock Holmes is, of course, one of the classical examples, in which Holmes suddenly turns to Dr. Watson and says, how many stairs are there leading up to our room in Baker Street here? And Watson, who had been over the stairs thousands of times, could not tell, because there had never been sufficient interest to cause him to count them. Yet we also know that under suggestion, Watson would know because subconsciously those stairs are recorded, but not consciously. If, therefore, we are consciously hastening toward a certain condition, we may be subjectively registering a wide variety of phenomena, uh, which at the moment is of no particular interest to us, certainly not sufficiently vital to make any conscious contribution uh, to our awareness. Yet all this information is available to us and is locked within a kind of filing system from which it can be drawn out in two ways. 
either by a technique such as hypnosis or suggestion or by a natural technique which is uh, referred to as uh, association mechanism. When there is some particular reason by which this particular submerged idea plays into a pattern, it may suddenly be remembered or brought into conscious awareness again. Now, in awareness of this kind, uh, this double awareness, conscious and subconscious operating together. The conscious is a rather prosaic thing, heavily indoctrinated with prejudices and opinions and beliefs, seeing only what it desires to see, seeing good only where it wishes to see good, and evil where it wishes to see evil. But beneath this conditioned faculty perception is the subconscious unconditioned acceptance of facts. Now this subjective factual acceptance is usually more observant than our conscious faculties because it is not conditioned and because it is not penalized by our moods and attitudes, nor is it educated into a kind of sensory dishonesty as is the case usually with our conscious uh, faculties. We are told, for instance, in the sphere of art, that no matter how peculiar, how unpleasant, how even uh, displeasing an art example may be, that if we are able to see it often enough, or if it comes into vogue and is frequently uh, brought to our attention, we can become accustomed to it, accept it, and finally uh, discover no longer any asymmetry or disproportion in it. The object has not changed, but we have changed our attitude toward it. This happens in connection with style, with clothing, with models of automobiles, with types of furniture, which cause us sometimes to divide so markedly between the new and the old discarding the old only because it is not new, and accepting the new only because it is not old, having no validity behind our attitude. And frequently, not accepting the new for some time until we become accustomed to it. Let us then apply this now to animate situations, rather than merely to furniture and houses and roads. Let us say that when we meet a person, we instinctively, objectively, make acceptances and rejections on the level of the familiar or on the level of conscious or semi-conscious association. If this person has tastes like our own, the person is admirable, obviously. If they happen to remind us of someone we like, they have a pleasing personality. If they wear the kind of clothes we admire, they have good taste. If they talk about subjects that interest us, they are intelligent and up to the moment. If they belong to the same club, they're practically brethren on the field. So by the time we have taken our acceptances based upon possibly a predisposition to like the person, we have come into a very sympathetic and very pleasant relationship. But it is quite possible that the discerning faculties of our inner sensory structure, uncontaminated by our good fellowship, have seen many things that consciously we have not seen at all, have made note of all kinds of little nuances little phrases and words that mean the opposite to what we think they mean. Hesitation in admitting certain situations that we passed over, but to these other faculties, might indicate ulterior motives. And little by little, these inner faculties have come to a far more complete picture of this person than we have. 
So if the inner faculties and the outer appearance of judgment come finally to a variance of some kind, we may suddenly get a hunch. We get an intuitive feeling that this person who we think is so admirable may not be quite as admirable as we think they are. We get a flash of some kind. I had a grandma that had flashes of that nature almost constantly. <laughs> sometimes she was right, sometimes she was wrong. When she was wrong, she always forgot it. When she was right, she always remembered it and developed quite a reputation as far as her own thinking was concerned as a sensitive. She was very psychic. This type of thing is not perhaps quite as ridiculous as it sounds because it does mean that we get feelings of people. We know that we have faculties of discrimination better than we use and that we see more than we know that we see, and hear more that we know than that we know we hear. Thus, we do have two levels of judgment. A quick judgment based upon the passing testimonies of senses, pretty well conditioned, and a slower judgment arising from thoughtfulness and reflection. And if this slower judgment simply cannot break through at any other time or in any other way because of its uh, the, uh, meeting a very highly opinionated exterior it may come to you in sleep, in dream symbols, causing us to see episodes or incidents involving these persons whom we have met, and by which something about them that we never noticed becomes highly dramatized. Later, perhaps, we learn that this internal apperception was true that this person was more like our hunch than our original estimation. We say to, my, uh, we say to ourselves, my goodness, I'm really quite psychic. Mm -hmm. I just do this all the time. I just didn't even like to admit it to myself. It's all very wonderful. Actually, it is not any indication of an extrasensory faculty at all. It merely represents the different levels upon which our normal faculties can function. But as we are aware of only one level of function, anything else to us is miraculous and mysterious, and we have to develop exaggerated ideas about it. We've already discussed on a number of occasions a point also that is of very great importance, and one which we so often overlook, particularly in matters relating uh, to sensory delusion. Anyone who has had delirium tremens or has uh, uh, developed advanced case of hashish eating or something of that nature, we trust none of our friends are in that group, <laughs> will record optical illusionary phenomena that is not due necessarily to hypnosis at all, but may be due to hypnotic drugs. So this Yodi coat among our Indians, and the hashish used by the Asani or the effects of the assassins in Persia. We do, however, have another example of this that is getting quite prevalent, and we're all getting close to it, and it can sometimes perhaps cause a considerable amount of complication. That is the use of these hypnotic drugs for sedation, for narcotics, and for anesthesia, and also in the terminal stages of advanced ailment. As a result of these uses of drugs, optical phenomena may be experienced by the sick who are not addicted to any unhappy habit under normal conditions. And we have had considerable record recently of extreme disturbance among the sick due to the use of some of these drugs, by which the most terrible experiences resembling nightmares and the like are recorded, involving visual phenomena of a most grotesque or even terrifying nature. Thus, this type of visual phenomena can occur 
as a result of narcotics and also as a result of certain excessive psychoses within the individual himself. He can force them or cause them to occur in his own life. Without the essential use of hypnosis, it is possible and is recorded that individuals capable of imagination or internal imagery. These rather sensitive persons who can create imaginary worlds within their lives, particularly as defenses and escape from the pressure of externals. Individuals who can create phantom lives for themselves through what we call daydreaming. Under some conditions, these phantom lives can be projected into the sensory equipment and can actually be visually animated. Thus, a person we have only imagined might and could very well sometime appear objectively as though in a room with us, a projection by the mind. Now, this projection is not a projection of a form outside of ourselves, but a projection of a mental image within the mental structure itself. And this mental image is placed in the same field that is receiving the image of the exterior room in which we are standing or sitting. Therefore, this image becomes involved in the room. But like a double exposure upon a photographic plate, the image is usually to some degree transparent or semi-transparent permitting the objects in the room to be seen through and around the image itself. This has often given rise to the idea of ghosts. And there are certain ghosts that are undoubtedly projected mental images because we can visualize ideas and give them form within ourselves. And this form can be mixed into our visual process so that it appears to be imposed upon a situation or scene outside of ourselves. This means that we can create ghosts. This does not necessarily mean that we create all ghosts. But it causes us to say that the mere fact that an individual has seen something is no more a proof of clairvoyance then is delirium tremens a proof of clairvoyance, or some fantasy observed as a result of an overtoxic situation arising from acute alcoholism. These situations all demand analysis and study, and as yet no effort has been made really to analyze them or to divide them one from another. The next question that would naturally come to our mind is, presuming that we have five sensory perceptions, is it possible, is it reasonable to assume that all of these perceptions have overtones? Is there any place in which we can say with certainty, at this point, the area of a sensory perception must inevitably end? We know that such is certainly not the case with hearing, because various scientific experiments in connection with deafness and semi-deafness have indicated that the individual's hearing can be artificially increased so that he may hear sounds not normally audible to himself or to other persons. We also know that there are certain kinds of high vibration sounds, such as certain dog whistles, which can be bought, which will call a dog and which you cannot hear. But the dog can. There is much to indicate that animals can hear sounds that we cannot hear. And we know that Indians on the reservation have unusual hearing which is lost to us because of the compensation of other faculties which we have developed. So that one Indian on a reservation down in New Mexico could clearly 
and definitely distinguish the ticking of a watch in a man's pocket over a hundred feet away. He could tell when the watch was stopped. We cannot hear that. It is possible that some animals could hear it. We do not know how acute hearing can be. Nor do we know what it would mean to things that we normally hear. If our hearing range came to include things which we do not normally hear. Supposing, for example, we were listening to a fine orchestration, and suddenly our hearing faculties were enlarged. Would this mean that, like high fidelity, we would enjoy it more? Or would this development, for which there was no compensation in our orchestration, result in our music suddenly turning into inharmony or into chaos because it would no longer be catering to certain preconceived levels and total developments which we now regard as harmonious. I remember one occasion Benjamin Franklin tells the story of how he was enjoying a certain bit of music that was being played and the poor dog under the window was dying from it miserable and howling and groaning. But to him, the music sounded fine. If we had a different type of music, would we enter into a different kind of sound world? And under such conditions, would the present sound world merely represent a part of this new world? Or would this larger hearing force us to change our entire concept? and cause us to find all the sounds that we now hear anharmonious. It is quite possible that it would. That a change of the limitation of our gamut would require a complete reorganization of our entire tonal concept and a re-education of our entire mental attitude toward sound. This could be quite important. I remember years ago in New York, I had a friend who was an opera singer who gained some reputation in the field. came for the first time to listen to some very high-class Chinese classical music. The opera singer in question was rather given to the Italian school. And after a few minutes of Chinese classics, that never heard such a horrible series of noises in their lives that could not be considered music. Later, my Chinese friend told me that his opinion of the Italian composers was identically the same. <laughs> now, this means something. It means one of two things. Either in racial differences, there are different tonal acceptances, or that the acceptance and rejection of harmony is conditioned by familiarity and repetition, and that things to us are harmonious and beautiful merely because we have become accustomed to them. Whereas that which is not harmonic is merely that with which we are not accustomed. That was Wagner's concern. But the only reason why we are offended by anharmonic intervals is simply because we are not accustomed to them. And he proceeded to use them in composition with great success. Everyone said it was terrible when he did it. Fifty years later, everyone said it was wonderful. It was just a change in the thinking of the people. So we know that one way or another, sound can be affected and influenced. Now what about things seen? Realizing that the seeing of something may have a profound effect upon the entire psychic life of the individual. Could we go so far as to agree with Buddha that the five senses make the person? And that if anything happened to these five senses, so that they carry different testimony from what they carry now, the person would be a different person. Some way we are nourished by the acceptance of these sensory reflexes. 
and build our lives around these exceptions. If then we could see something we do not see now, would any part of our world remain unchanged? Supposing we could add a clear extra perception to the higher or to the lower end of our visual scale. And suppose in the moment of so doing, we suddenly came into a universe with different dimensions from those that we know today. It is quite possible that even one or two steps higher or lower in our visual scale would completely change our relation to space because that extension might fill space with things always there but as yet unseen. We might suddenly find ourselves surrounded by people, races, creatures that have always been here but about which we have no conscious realization. This was the burden of the thinking of Socrates at the time of his last discourse, when he declares that he perceives people living along the shores of the air as men live along the shores of the sea. Supposing this universe is populated with many forms of life that we do not know, and that science fiction has a certain basis, then the moment we contacted those forms of life, the moment we contacted levels of ourselves previously unknown, perhaps our entire materialism would fall to pieces, for our way of life is developed from the gamut of our sensory perceptions. Change any of these perceptions, and we change the entire pattern of our existence. For this reason, the question has again been raised. Is there any evidence but man's perceptions are changing, basically. Have we any reasonable justification for assuming that a thousand years from now, or ten thousand years from now, we will have a different sensory orientation from what we have today, and that many things now regarded as mystical or mysterious or metaphysical will in that time become part of the common faculty allotment of the individual? This is a tricky question. I don't intend to evade it or avoid it, but it is not a question on which prophecy can safely be made. Go back now to consider what has been the story of man's sensory perception gamut. It would seem that man's perceptions have always been in conflict, that he has possessed a subjective and met met metaphysical or mystical perception field. That this is very clear and well developed in primitive people in comparison to the development in modern sophisticated man. Therefore, we would appear to find a gradual diminishing of these extrasensory faculties over a long period of time. That in all probabilities are remote answers 10,000, 50,000 years ago, were more psychic than we are. That gradually the objectification of our way of life and the building of ever greater dependency upon external things and the loss of the need for these subjective factors, these factors have caused them to decrease in acuteness. For example, man today does not need the defensive mechanism of the squirrel. He does not need the protective devices which are found in primitive animals. He does not need uh, the almost psychical apperception of the savage man who had to survive in a world of constant dangers and hazards. Thus, those faculties which enable primitive man, perhaps, to de detect the presence of an animal that was stalking him, these faculties are no longer valuable to us. He is no longer stalked by animals in the jungle. He is now shouted at by television commercials. <laughs> the end is the same. <laughs> Both the animal and the television announcement are out to get him. 
But instead of needing highly sensitive faculties to get the warning, to say he must tune the machine down because the warning is so loud he can hear nothing else. So that these sensitive things disappear, and man, generally speaking, appears to be ever less sensitive with the passing of time. On the other hand, man is gradually moving away from this materialistic integration. He is beginning to recognize that he is moving toward problems which he cannot solve. And the pressure of externals is forcing him to search for internal values and resources. So it would seem that somewhere this process of the gradual loss of extrasensory faculties flows down, finally reverses itself, and that over a long period of time these faculties will be intensified again. For in both cases they were for purposes of survival. Man became materially objective in order to survive in a material world. His material world and his survival here are now hazarded by other factors. These other factors demand subjective sensory awareness, so in all probability he will ultimately develop it. Whether he will develop it rapidly is a question. But I think the researchers at Duke indicate definitely that in some persons there is an extension of faculty not generally diffused at this time but present in enough individuals to establish a pattern and to indicate that in all probabilities a degree of extrasensory power is in every person. But this degree remains competitively undeveloped in many persons. Why it should be developed in some and not in others is still a philosophical problem. But I suspect strongly that it has to do with the focus of the personality in terms of material interest. We know, for example, that most primitive people who were searching for internal cognition or trying to develop superphysical faculties did so by departing from the ordinary way of life and especially by prayer and fasting. And the entire history of mysticism indicates that the reduction of the food content has a tremendous amount to do with the development of extrasensory faculties. The American Indian proved this. Uh, among your early Christian mystics, this was clearly indicated. And among your great teachers, Jesus, the Lord, the Buddha, all of these leaders are known as ascetics but they departed from worldliness and in most instances engaged in extensive fast, as also did Pythagoras. This fasting especially lowers the sugar content in the brain and seemingly results in a clarification of faculties by the reduction of toxins. If, therefore, false vision and delusion arise from toxin, intoxication. Clear vision or clear sight seems to arise from the purification of the body from such uh, conditions as might normally interfere with hypersensitivity. We note also that where individuals suffer from psychic problems that nearly all uh, we can assist these persons by the regulation of their diet and that a psychic intensity has to have a certain type of nutrition in order to flourish. A negative psychic uh, condition nearly always depends upon some kind of a diet that is heavy in the wrong type of food or is deficient in those kinds of foods which have a tendency to prevent supersensory uh, 
experiences of one kind or another. For example, an individual who is having psychic trouble will very often correct the situation almost instantly by increasing his intake of protein and sugar. This means that uh, protein and sugar have a tendency to prevent certain types of internal experience. Now, let me warn you against the danger of trying this in reverse and attempting to develop spiritual values and propensities by dropping these items from your diet or restricting them. If you try it, you will get into trouble. Because the individual, unless he has certain basic groundwork, cannot orient himself in any of these situations. And nearly always, your so-called extrasensory gamut comes as a very serious problem into the life of the individual who attempts to cause it by any artificial means whatsoever. Only when it is the inevitable consequence of normal functions or patterns long established can it be endured. And we warn seriously against any effort to experiment with this type of thing. It is not good because it represents, as in the case of your mystic and ascetic, your ancient holy man, your priest and your prophet, a kind of dedication of a total life that has nothing whatever to do with dabbling or experimenting in the term that we use today. But now we have exhausted another possibility which explains certain phenomena with which we are concerned. Psychology has taught us the importance of remembering that a large part of man's psychic life is influenced by the happenings of his early life. We are many of us influenced, therefore, by modifying conditions in our own early lives of which we have no conscious memory. There are very many associates, situations, reports, which were we to suddenly discover them today, we would regard as evidence of mystical faculty. But in reality, they are only memories that have, only, uh, that have always been there but which have not been brought into objectivity. We also recognize uh, that in psychical phenomena, which is quite common, uh, a great part of it, not all, we don't say all, but a great part of it, can be attributed to the inconsistency which exists between the surface person and the subjective person. Five hundred years ago, the four faces of Eve would have been treated on the steps of the cathedral as demoniacal possessions. Two hundred years ago, it would have been treated for the same thing, but not on the steps of the cathedral. Now it is passed over as a psychological phenomena of interest. No one gets very excited over it, except the idea of creating a book which is going to produce a reasonable revenues to the author and publisher. Actually, you have here in this problem of multiple personality merely an indication of the different beings inside of ourselves. Uh, the four faces all had their own temperament, their own attitudes, their own dispositions, and part of the time separate existence. Now this is not so common. Usually, this separate existence situation is merged in a confusion, and we do not find too much separate existence. Maybe a little occasionally operating in the daydream, in the sleep phenomena, or perhaps in temporary pressures of personality. But actually, we do have a great many different individuals who can play various parts in our lives and can, under certain conditions, appear to us as separate persons. Let us take for a very simple fact that in a dream, any 
psychic area of pressure, which we may have within ourselves, can be, and usually is, symbolically impersonated as an individual. Thus someone appearing to us, either in dream or so-called vision, may be the symbolical personification of a pressure, of an attitude, of a psychic tension within our own nature, or one of the symbolical parts of the psychic field itself, the various parts of which play such an involved and confused role in the numerous aspects of our personality. Ordinary individuals in their daily lives move along through the day, the month, and the year. And as far as they know, they are always one person. I question it very much. And I think if you will analyze this fact carefully, you will question it very much. You will realize that you are a nice, quiet, placid individual until <laughs> a situation of a certain nature arose. Then suddenly you became highly defensive, extremely suspicious, critical, tyrannical, short-tempered. Then, slowly this faded away, accompanied perhaps by a general depletion. Uh, you didn't feel very good after this outburst. And so you had to take a little rest. And you finally got back again to the normal state of this kindly, good-natured disposition that you were acquainted with. Then everything went along very well until your neighbor suddenly got a new automobile. <laughs> then suddenly, for no reason at all, a very avaricious genius began to develop inside of you and take on demoniacal proportions. Anything good that happened to that neighbor was a cosmic misfortune, as far as you were <laughs> You did not wish them any bad luck, but you hoped they'd never have any good luck with that car. You suddenly stopped in your tracks. You said, is this, is this me? I'm a nice person. Why should I want something unhappy to happen to my neighbor? Because he's fortunate enough to have a better car. Well, the only reason why I, don't, I feel the way I do is because he doesn't deserve that car. It should have been wrong to me. I'm the fellow that deserves it. He's a no good. I'm a hard-working man. He gets a new car. I drive one five years old. So I think I shall have a long thought on what we're going to do about changing administration at the next election. <laughs> and after a while, this gets tiresome, so we drop back into this normal pattern of being good-natured people again. Then all of a sudden, the little boy gets sick. Suddenly, our good-natured selves become a monument of fear, terror almost. We love this child. We've got to do something quick. For the last five years, we've been telling everyone how little we thought of doctors. If a little boy is sick, so the first thing we do is phone the quickest one, the nearest one we can find. We say afterwards, was that me that did that? I'm not supposed to like doctors. Then and something else comes along. And this child, the sickness of this child, suddenly we forget all kinds of things that were important. We hadn't thought very much about religion. We thought that religion was something that other people needed. And all of a sudden we begin to wonder if perhaps we shouldn't do a little praying for that child. And we suddenly realize what the men used to say and what they meant when they said there were very few atheists and foxholes during the war. <laughs> Trouble has hit us. All of a sudden, our universe isn't sufficient anymore, and a whole new personality comes through us. A personality essentially atavistic. What we would like and what we would accept instantly is the rattle and the fetish of the medicine man, if it would only get that little boy well again. If we begin to wonder whether a miracle could be performed and how we would go about to order one. <laughs> then after a while, the little fellow gets better, this all sinks back again. And all the time, there are different people coming to us under every different type of stimulation or association mechanism. Something else comes out. It has been there all the time. The nasty temperament was there all the time. We had such a nice disposition. 
fear was there all the time that we were perfectly sure of ourselves. Envy was there where we were perfectly contented. All these things are there. Now when they start moving out, as though someone lifted the lid of Pandora's box, we come face to face with ourselves as we have never known ourselves. And under such conditions, we may be excused if some of ourselves remind us a little bit of some of the imps of perdition that we've read about. Could we be this way? Or are we upset? Has some demon taken possession of us? Back in the Middle Ages, it was very easy. Any time you didn't uh, live the way you believed you should, there was a demon responsible. Because nobody had any faults of their own. Today we begin to wonder whether it is an imp of darkness whispering in our ears or just an ordinary streak in ourselves. Now we begin to know that it is this streak in ourselves. So that there are the selves in us, better than we know, worse than we know, different. There is the artist and the businessman, the musician and the carpenter, the carpenter and the banker, all these crisscrossing, which make us very complicated human beings. And on the surface, only a little personality with a conventional appearance which we generally regard as ourselves. Actually, this little personality is not ourselves. It is merely a puppet that we're holding on one hand, like a marionette in the Punch and Judy show. The great operation is going on underneath and behind, and practically unnoticed. With this larger operation taking place, things are happening every moment that are not to be easily explained in our everyday philosophy. These things, to some of us, mean nothing. They just pass unconsidered. But to another type of mind, or to any type of mind, under certain conditions, these things become omens of the great signs and shadows of impending events. All kinds of strange things move and stir within us when we become sensitive to the profound diffusion of our own internal life. All this has to be considered. All these elements have to be examined before we can go on and affirm or assume that there is anything miraculous. And then we come face to face with the famous Paracelsian axiom, which is very, very wise and very good. Namely, that there is no such a thing as a miracle. So that a miracle is an effect, the cause of which is unknown, but must be equal to the effect that it produces, because we live in a lawful universe. Consequently, these various faculty perceptions which seem to escape into some wild world of unbelievable magic or mystery, all these strange stories that tie in with Indian sorcery and Tibetan magic, Somewhere, all these stories belong in a lawful universe. And the moment we lose orientation of lawfulness, we begin to slip into a strange miasma which will quickly intoxicate us, demoralize us, and totally disintegrate and, and uh, destroy our sense of equilibrium and common sense. expand or extend so-called natural faculties, and that most so-called supernatural powers are natural powers which we do not understand, and that gradually these natural powers, because they are natural, will have their normal and proper growth and development, and each one will usher us into a kind of world suitable to itself and give us a participation in value or problem beyond what we know at the present time. The principal problems that we face today on the so-called extrasensory level have therefore been taken up by a group like Dr. Rhine and his associates at Duke, and they have advanced almost a 
common answer to everything. Now, we're always a little afraid of these pat answers. When we have one answer for everything, we begin to pause for a moment. And remember that we have not yet cured the common head cold. There is no proof that any solution is a total answer. But along comes the Duke group with the concept that what we might term a kind of telepathy is actually the solution to practically every form of so-called extrasensory perception. That mental transference explains psychism, explains mediums, explains clairvoyance, and that practically every problem that appears to imply an extrasensory situation can be solved on the basis that man does possess a faculty of picking out of the minds of other persons certain leading thoughts or ideas. So we have thought transference, which a hundred years ago was considered itself a form of magic. Today it is beginning to take on the respectable appearance of a probability. We are now gravely suspicious, particularly as the result of development in radio and television, that it is quite conceivable that man does possess a receiving set within himself which can react to uh, energies moving from the mental and emotional fields of other persons. And it is, therefore, quite possible for us to pick things out of other people's minds. It is also true in most cases that we do not know that we are doing this, that the process is not yet voluntary, that we may not even know whose minds we are picking these things out of, nor are we in any way certain that they have to be contemporary minds. We live in a world of minds. We know that it is perfectly possible to go to the archives of a motion picture studio, get out a film that was made 20 years ago, and run it again. We also know perfectly well that vibration never ceases. Therefore, although it is forever changing, never diffusing, it never ends once it is set in motion. Scientists not so long ago were really seriously contemplating the possibility of creating a device sensitive enough to pick out of space Lincoln's Gettysburg Address in the original, that it is conceivable that it can be done. It will be in a wonderful, strange, and a little morbid day when it comes to pass that everything that we have said or will say in the near future could be picked out of space by somebody a hundred years from now, especially some of those rather quiet talks in the back room. <laughs> Family arguments, name calling, and also those various legislative procedures behind closed doors might make wonderful material for mental uh, reviving at some future time probably would result in the total rewriting of history and the complete collapse of our psychology of historical orientation, which might be a good thing. <laughs> now, if it is possible that a mind can pick out of other minds or other times or out of the mental life of the total collective folk or body of mankind, certain thoughts, then it might be also fair to say that everything else being equal, those thoughts in the collective mind most strongly held would be most quickly available to other minds, because the body of such thinking, more intense, uh, more co with more continuity, would be a more powerful vibratory wave likely to break through into 
the consciousness of a sensitive person more rapidly than perhaps some gentle and very furtive rain, that it has little, if any, support down through time. That we may live in a world in which some of our thinking is derived from other minds, perhaps much of it, opens an interesting field of speculation. First it was heredity, then it was mental telepathy, which was advanced to answer the question of why we behave like human beings. Is it possible, therefore, that all our thinking is affected by waves of mental energy around us, that perhaps everywhere, all the time, we are being bombarded by thoughts? Obviously, there has to be some control of this, or else we would be drowned in a world of collective thoughts, notions, and attitudes. We are not. Some method of integration, of filtering, of control and direction is present in our own data, nature, so that apparently we do our own thinking. But under certain conditions, pressures seem to arise in our thinking, which we cannot account for, and which then, perhaps, may be regarded as arising from collective thought, or from the mental life of the world around us. This is an intriguing procedure to develop. It also suggests a universal availability of common thought material. The only possible answer to the problem at the moment is that the faculty for the receiving and interpreting into objective awareness of these collective pressures is very slightly present in the majority of persons. But in some individuals, in a small number of individuals, it is rather more present, but in very few indeed to any degree of exceptional markedness. Thus, a truly consistent mind or telepathist, who can perform any useful or notable achievement in such a field is extremely rare, and when such a person appears, becomes a wonder of his generation. <coughs> Yet that such a person can appear, there seems to be no doubt. Therefore, he is either a freak, an anomaly of some kind, or else he bears witness to a law. And as we are inclined to believe that there are no accidents and no real freaks, and that all things pertain to law, there must be an explanation for such a person. This explanation may force us to accept ultimately that such a faculty is latent in every human being. The next point that goes beyond this uh, situation relates to the application of this so-called telepathic faculty, in the ability of the individual to capture uh, some lost or forgotten factor in the life of an individual. Let's take a simple case and see if we can make anything else. The individual goes to a sensitive or a mystic or a psychic, saying that at some past time a valuable document was lost. Where was this uh, document placed? The psychic, in a short time, is able to come up with an answer as to where the document is. Experience and experimentation indicate that this would be a remarkable occurrence. Yet, the proof lies in the fact that the document was in the place so described and was promptly rescued. Now, such things have happened. In fact, there is a person in the United States at the present time whose specialty is to help the police to solve crimes. And they have come to a very marked degree of success with cases completely baffling the police, in which no known element of help could be found. Thus, such a thing is possible. Now the question arises, who knew? where that document was originally placed. How did it get into the place 
where it was found without the individual who sought for it knowing where it was. The next question is, did this person ever know where it was? That is a very def def difficult question. Under hypnotic regression, it has been found, on some occasions at least, that the lost article was actually placed where it was found by the person later unable to remember where it was. And therefore, that in the subconscious of this person, the true location of the article was always known. In the subconscious of this person, the true location of the article might be known in other ways. For instance, supposing this article had been placed where it was found by a parent, friend, or relative of the individual searching for it, and done during the childhood or infancy of the person who later sought it, if in their presence, 40 or 50 years ago, when they may not have been over six weeks old, the person who placed the article stated in their presence to someone else where the article was, it could always be refound from the subconscious of that younger individual. So who knows all the details of this particular situation? If the article was placed, someone knew where it was. Did that someone tell anyone else? Is that someone dead? Before they died, did they communicate it to anyone else who might be keeping that secret? If so, it could still be picked out of somebody's mind. So the problem of the mind as its relationship to these situations is extremely tricky. Now there is another problem that is almost equal to tricky, and that is that we possess another faculty which must sometimes be recognized. And that faculty is our ability to sensitively pick up atmospheric impressions. This is generally called psychometry or the ability to recover impressions from objects, articles, or places. Such faculty does exist, although also very rare. It is perfectly possible to place a glass of water in a room, that a hundred people walk through that room within 24 hours. A psychometrist sufficiently gifted can then take the glass of water and describe every person. But there are very few that possess this gift. Yet it exists. Therefore, it is possible to pick up all kinds of information from inanimate subjects in which impressions of energy have been placed. In other words, is mental energy the only kind that can be received? Or can sensory energy also be picked up by an extrasensory band of faculty perception? Can sound made in the past be heard again through a retentive power of our ability to hear? And so through all of the sensory faculties. This is again a good question. We do not know the answer conclusively. But we do know that during World War II, a certain person received a letter from a very close relative in a German concentration camp. It was a little note, very little to it, sent through the Red Cross, which permitted only the signature of the person and that he might X two or three statements such as, I am well, or uh, I am not well, or I am uh, in need of something which the Red Cross might permit to be sent through. Very little could be placed upon this piece of because it was a concentration camp note. This note was received by the nearest of kin of the individual in the concentration camp. This nearest of kin, believing their relative to be dead, was overjoyed to find out that the person was still alive. And in their uh, almost completely um, subjective delight over the matter, took the note to bed, this little card-like note, and went to sleep holding this in their hand. 
in the middle of the night they awoke, awakened with a tremendous experience of visualization. They saw the concentration camp. They saw that friend or relative. They saw the kind of a place he lived in. They saw the number of windows, the shape of the doors, every part of this building and several other persons close to the individual. A careful note was made, and by an intuitive procedure, though now awake, the person holding the note made a sketch of the detail of the concentration camp they had seen. Later, this was compared with an actual photograph of the camp after the war was over and agreed in every detail. And apparently the only contact was this note and the intensity of the individual. Thus we may assume that something which Paracelsus called an effluvia or energy containing something susceptible of impression was certainly communicated there are many cases in which primitive medicine priests, witch doctors, voodoo doctors, have been able to take photographs of persons. And taking ten photographs of unknown persons and spreading those photographs out in front of them, move their hands over the surface of the photograph and call out each one who is already dead. Because they said that the photograph itself carried some kind of a vibratory relationship to the person. Most primitive people will not allow a likeness of themselves to be made because they fear sorcery. These things we do not believe in general, but we do not explain them. And uh, research such as has been carried on in a few groups in this country and in Europe would seem to indicate that there is every reason to suspect that there are energy fields uh, which can be contacted. Also that there are persons called sensitive who are born with a somewhat more acute development of certain faculties, often accompanied by an inferior development of some other faculties, who are able to become more conscious or more aware of this extrasensory gamut uh, than the average individual but that this does not mean either magic or sorcery or the presence of some extraordinary mystical attribute. It is simply that we live in a world of dimensions and powers and faculties and propensities, most of which are unknown to us. And we have been so busy trying to prove there were no more than what we know that we have gradually worked ourselves into a situation in which our natural growth it's beginning to reveal energies and powers for which we have no explanation because we have not attempted to create rational explanation for these things. Now it would not be fair to go on in this direction without pointing our entire thinking to certain other values which are certainly close to our consideration. From the scientific and the psychological and the study of the extrasensory field as it is now being explored by a few progressive scientists, we must go on to our philosophical and religious fields, where to a large measure our deepest concerns would naturally be. Does man possess uh, these faculties of true knowing by means of which it is possible for him to rise from the level of sense and opinion and approach a state of clear insight or clear voyance or clear seeing by means of which error can be overcome in his own contemplation of life. Is it possible for man to have the direct experience of God is the mystical experience a bona fide spiritual experience or is it a psychological experience? 
is it possible that man can develop and intensify faculties of inner living and inner thinking by means of it? He can become aware of a spiritual world beyond the one in which he now exists. Is this a kind of positive overtone of spiritualism? For whereas spiritualism consists of communications, at least so assumed, between the living and the dead, is this other thing man's ability to experience a living participation in a world beyond the one in which he now lives? I believe that the first approach to this lies in the records of antiquity. And to a measure at least, these records are negative uh, from the standpoint of true spiritual experience. We know that ancient people did create a condition of temporary clairvoyance by hypnosis and drugs. We know that they were able to cause persons to have the experience of leaving this kind of world that we know and coming into another kind of world, entirely apart from anything that we commonly experience today. Was this world genuine, or is it merely a kind of dream world in which the individual subjectively retiring into his own consciousness, there experiences a universality uh, which he cannot explain or interpret in terms of his ordinary sensory perception? It would seem that such can happen. Whether this is the total answer must be given further thought, but that man can appear to have a separate life in a dream state, that he is capable of a kind of inner living in which he is not aware of dream, but seems to exist in another kind of world, but that this world is subjectively within himself we may affirm to be a possible experience. Is there another possible experience in which he proceeds into a true world beyond the one which he knows at the present time? The empiric answer to such a question is rather obvious. Namely, that there is no possible reason to question why man could not have a larger experience. To deny a larger experience is to empirically deny the possibility that there are things around us and with us at all times which are not within the range of our sensory perception. It is almost certain from our modern scientific knowledge that we are isolated into a very small part of a living universe that the larger part of this universe is simply beyond our sensory experience, <coughs> but has a perfectly valid existence. Anything, therefore, which would cause a sudden and dramatic repolarizing of our sensory experience, or make available to us faculties or perceptions not now generally available, could well launch us into an entirely different kind of world. <coughs> that this kind of world might be... <coughs> Uh, in some way reminiscent of the kind of world that has been observed by mystics in their dreams and visions is not impossible. For it is quite possible that these dreams and visions actually represent attunement to a sphere beyond our common experience. Thus there could well be a universe of races and types of life and degrees of advancement and achievements and attainment that we simply do not know anything about. It is also possible, as has been pointed out, that under certain peculiar situations, the individual might have a temporary uh, glimpse of such a larger universe. There are several records in classical writing, such as the vision of Scipio and others, of persons brought close to death or believed to be dead or in a state of suspended animation so complete that no pulse was to be found in the body at all. Yet this person did revive after having been pronounced dead. Under such conditions, these persons frequently report 
experiences which occur. And it is interesting to note that usually these reports are similar if not identical. Therefore, it is quite possible that they bear witness to a dimension of faculty perception made available to us by the separation of consciousness from body. Therefore, that the obscuration of consciousness or faculty by body is one of the reasons why the gamut of our senses is so limited. That it is the bodily structure through which the senses operate that restricts them to the narrow field which we recognize. Therefore, that the separation of consciousness from body may also release faculties from material restriction and permit a larger area of faculty receptivity. That consciousness may well survive death is now a greatly considered point. And whereas in the past this was held to be purely religious, it is now held to be quite possibly scientific by a number of our more prominent thinkers. Thus we are moving toward a little different attitude on the whole problem of our spiritual life. Almost all systems of religion and philosophy have used certain disciplines in order to refine the lives of disciples and initiates for the attainment of the internal experience of the presence of God or truth. Most religious groups are able to produce examples of individuals who were so illumined and in whose lives marked and marvelous changes took place which cannot be normally accounted for on the level of ordinary conduct. Thus Christianity has its St. Francis of Assisi. It has its uh, St. Buenaventura. It has its mystics. It has its prophets. So have the ancient testament. So have other people of every part of the world. And these mystics all maintain the validity of an inner kind of vision and declare that by means of this vision, the uncertainties and non-tranquillities of material life were removed and that a new assurance, a new security, and an irresistible impulse to virtue. All these were bestowed by a dynamic experience of personal consciousness. What this personal experience is, this mystical experience of Havelock Ellis, perhaps we may not be in a complete position to say. But one thing we are reasonably certain, that it is either the nearest to reality that man can achieve, or else it is the most glorious of all illusions, an illusion which transforms life from mediocrity to magnificence, and as such is itself worthy of cultivation. For we can judge all things only by their consequences, and we are inclined to cultivate or encourage that the consequences of which are in every way meritorious, producing a better level of living, a greater dedication to principle a greater love for fellow man, and a greater veneration for the principles of life and truth and virtue. Thus, regardless of our approach, we have the common opinion of all men in the reverence of many and in the actual experience of a few that there is a group of power, faculties, or energies resident in man by means of which he is able to actually transcend his own humanity, arriving or ascending to a place in which is superior to that commonly inhabited by his reason and his emotions, where he is capable of a transcendent concept and experience of life. How then might we say that such a situation could be produced? We can go back to our original premise, namely that in all probability our sensory perceptions are limited uh, by the bodily vibratory rate, by means of which 
our external personality, having attained to a certain degree of organic development, becomes the blinder or restrictor of our vision, holding our sensory reflexes to a certain level and giving us only a gamut within which we can function. All of our philosophies are agreed upon one point, namely that the refinement of man's own organic nature, the gradual sublimation of his intensity, his psychological, spiritual, intellectual maturity, maturity in this case being released from unreasonable pressure and intensity, freedom from ignorance, release from superstition, a complete overcoming of fear, and the gradual integration of life in a strangely calm, orderly pattern of conduct. In other words, the removal of pressure. That the individual in a completely relaxed condition is in this condition most likely and most able uh, to penetrate through the pressures uh, which normally restrict, limit, and even hypnotize his sensory perception. Buddha takes the position very firmly that what we would term man's apperception of divine things is prevented solely by his dedication and his psychological allegiance to human things. Therefore, that as long as man's mental energy is defending his humanity, it will continue to obscure his divinity. If, however, man releases himself from his ego pressure, releases himself from all of the circumstances by which he binds his consciousness totally to his own objective life, then and then only is he able to allow consciousness to flow naturally or to reveal naturally its own universality. Most of our greater mystics have assumed that man possesses a spiritual organ of perception. That this spiritual organ of perception perceives or accepts into itself a spiritual experience and is capable, not only by sight alone, but by a magnificent compound of senses, an apperceptive total experience that it is capable, therefore, of accepting the total impact of total life within its own structure. That this faculty is a kind of synthetic faculty. That it is composed of the five faculties that we know plus two we do not know. And that these together, forming a septenary, constitute man's capacity to accept into himself the pure impulse of life or God. That this impulse of life or God, having been accepted into his nature, is immediately conditioned by his personality. And when brought through into his objective awareness, will always be clothed completely in his own expectancies. If he believes a certain thing, his experience of truth will be in the terms of that thing. And for this reason, any individual who has an experience cannot be convinced by another person who has had a contrary experience, that both can be right. Each person assumes that his own experience must be the true and valid experience for all men. He does not realize that the way in which light comes to him is determined by his own capacity to accept light and by the specializations which exist within his own preconceptions. Consequently, as your Eastern mystic points out, always these mystical experiences take symbolic form, except in the case of the individual who has completely transcended the symbolic process in himself. The individual who has achieved the complete suspension of ego, so that he expects nothing, requires nothing, demands no form, shape, condition, or kind of experience, and does not have to interpret this experience in any ordinary familiar symbolism. Only such a person is capable of a pure experience, 
And this is extremely rare. The formless acceptance of God. The acceptance of deity totally. A complete possession by God without qualification, condition, or modification in which this God has no appearance, no humanity, is bound to no gospel and no creed, quotes no scripture, but is simply present as a total life, indicates the emancipation of the individual from any and all conditioning attributes. The purpose of your old mystery instruction was always to reduce these conditionings so that the individual could come closer and closer to this pure experience, which is the pure validity of experience. Wherever this pure experience comes, it is formless, pictureless, and comes as a complete clairsentience, a complete awareness without any center of awareness a simple overflowing of life into that person. Life, consciousness, and being moving in upon this individual from every direction, carrying with it only the total effulgency of its own significance and its own sufficiency. No condition of any kind. But such an experience naturally cannot be communicated to anyone else. It cannot be adequately formulated, formulated mentally. And any effort to reason upon it, to think about it, to pass judgment on it, annihilates it. It cannot be named, nor can it be analyzed. It must be merely and completely accepted as it is, as a total experience, totally apart from any limited or personal adjustment that we might have. Our philosophies and religions affirm that such an experience is possible. We have no scientific data to the effect that it is not possible. The only answer lies in the fact that it represents a level of cognition as yet not available to the majority of persons, but not an unreasonable extension of another kind of cognition which we all experience constantly and also for which we have no name. And that is the experience of sudden comprehension. Uh, we are studying something. Let us take, for example, for this purpose, the study of language. We'll give us a good example of the point. We're going to study a foreign language. We're going to study German. English is our tongue. So we start and we learn the German pronunciation of the letters. We begin to study the structure of German verbs, we begin to ponderously attempt to pronounce certain mysterious, dotted German tones, which are to the non-German quite confusing. We begin also to adjust ourselves to the fact that gender is a strange animal in German, and that we never know when we look at a table, or a chair, or the ceiling, or a book, whether it's male, female, or neutral. These things are very confusing. So we proceed to try to learn German, thinking English. We try to think English into German and German into English. And we go along like this, lame in our meaning and our method. But we do stay with it, with everything that we have. And suddenly, without warning, suddenly, we seem to move on the opposite side of the fence. Suddenly we awaken one morning and discover that we have learned how to think German. From that moment on, the language just goes along beautifully. And we have the language. We have it the moment something happens, which is a kind of little illumination inside of ourselves, a new orientation. And up to that point, we're in trouble every minute. From that point on, the trouble ceases, and it is only a matter of increasing vocabulary and gaining increasing familiarity. We have mastered some mysterious thing inside of ourselves. Now, the same thing happens constantly in living. There is a kind of comprehension, the kind of comprehension that suddenly makes a man who has a lot of tools into a carpenter. Something happens. 
or the individual who has a lumber of brushes and some canvases suddenly, after a certain amount of discipline, a certain amount of integration, suddenly feels himself an artist. Until that happens, he cannot accomplish a great deal. This has to come. And it comes through certain awareness, certain experience, certain patience, certain familiarity and repetition until this thing happens. Now, this is the principle about which most of your great religious systems have developed their concept of illumination. It is that in a certain situation, after a certain effort, a certain consecration, a certain dedication over a period of time, there is a sudden burst of light from within the, the consciousness. It suddenly knows or grasps these factors with which it has previously labored as a thing separate from itself. When it accepts them into itself, you have this mysterious thing. It has accepted them into itself. It has intuited them. It has come to know them as an experience by what we call intuition. So there is that moment in which we suddenly find that all the labor of the past is bearing its fruit. And until that time, it looked very sterile and difficult. The same way in disciplines of philosophy, mysticism, and religion, there are long roads in which nothing seems to happen. We go along hoping to know, struggling to find out, seeking to believe, desperately desirous of being convinced of something bigger or better. Suddenly, something happens. And all this labor, this effort, becomes and sold, dynamically, vibrantly possessed by something. And in that moment, all the doubts and uncertainties seem to fade away, and we are in possession of. We have gained a facility in. We know certain facts about this thing with which we have been laboring. And so we, the ancients, have this idea of a kind of cognition, a cognition that results from the patient application of principles and the gradual refinement of structure, the unfoldment of capacity, the devotion of life to the service of its own primary need, this need for life. And then suddenly, all these things in their own good time bearing their own proper fruit the arriving or arising of this situation that seems to be the solution, the answer, the natural product of all this effort, striving and trying that has previously come to us. In this, then, the ancients believed uh, man has this power, the power which lies behind the senses. After all, what is the power that animates sensory perception? It is energy. Man has five senses that he knows of and two that are as yet not completely individual. Literally, the seventh sense, which is sense in suspension, the Sabbath of the senses, the resting or the peace of the senses, contains all of them. And this seventh sensory power, which is the chemical substance of all the others, is the faculty or sensory power of pure conception or pure knowing, pure apperceiving. When the faculties separately continue their way, man lives in a universe of fragments. When two or more of them unite, these fragments begin to make order. When five of them unite, we have civilization for whatever it is worth. When seven of them unite, we have consciousness a factual situation brought into objectivity by the union of divided parts. For only by their union and by the new faculty released by their union is man capable of total cognition. Therefore, scientifically, if you wish to assume it, what we would call cosmic consciousness is merely the inevitable extension of ordinary consciousness. There's nothing mysterious about it. It is the destiny and end of all consciousness that it shall be universal. 
And it is the destiny of all creatures that they shall grow and unfold until they are capable of becoming the conscious instruments of this consciousness. But at various times along the way, as we all observe, there are what we would term anomalies. There are persons who are born apparently out of time, often before their time. There are persons who lived 2,000 years ago whose vision is greater than ours today. There are leaders, philosophers, and mystics of the past whose understanding we have not yet equaled. Thus also in our daily lives there are those around us who have different degrees of the inevitable development of these sensory conscious factors. And occasionally out of these patterns there comes an exceptional example. These exceptional examples are more frequent than we realize but we do not recognize them because we are not trained to know what constitutes an extra faculty power. Actually, almost everything that we call genius represents an intensification of faculties. A great musician, a great artist, a great sculptor, these persons represent levels of consciousness development beyond that of the ordinary. If it were not true, we could all do what they do, and we cannot. We cannot all be a Leonardo da Vinci. But he is simply an example of a development of faculties and an arrangement of them, by means of which greater resources are available to him because there is less confusion and conflict among the sensory faculties and less obscuration of these faculties by the density of ignorance and matter. These persons have earned their abilities, and they have sharpened the instruments by constant use. We are not sharpening our instruments as rapidly as they did, therefore we do not possess them. But actually, consciousness is in many ways. John Sebastian Bach had a great consciousness for music. This consciousness was just as truly a mystical thing as were the revelations of Emanuel Swedenborg or Andrew Jackson Davis. There is just as much mystery and wonder in the magnificent attainments of great musicians, artists, creative geniuses, and even great creative scientists as there are in the so-called fabled Mahatmas of Asia. All of these represent degrees of consciousness faculty development. And uh, we have around us constant examples of these attainments. If these attainments move particularly and directly into philosophy and religion, then we think of these persons as prophets, sages, saviors, world teachers, and regard them as essentially different from attainment in other fields. Actually, all consciousness growth represents the gradual attainment of a superior state of internal cognition, a hyper-awareness of values, factors, powers, forces, energies, substances necessary for the expression of creativity. And when we are able to tune into these things, we are able to produce the outstanding work which these persons produced. They did not know how they did it. They did not realize what was happening. But many of them were extremely devout and did sense that this power that was in them was not merely their own but with the power of a divine principle moving within them. This type of dedication is the recognition that all great works are the works of the one great worker, that worker being the divine power in man. Adjustment to this power is, therefore, a natural degree of consciousness. And that such consciousness is possible, we have every reason to assume. That all that passes for it is not this. We also know, but we further realize that the proof of these things is in terms of their works. True consciousness produces works which are natural to itself and reveal their integrity and their security through all time to come. False consciousness is usually associated with pretensions not sustained by works and may therefore be rather easily discriminated by those who have the faculty to know. An individual, without becoming especially better or more noble, may sharpen certain faculties, 
may even develop in extrasensory bands such as that of telepathy. But the individual who desires to have a strange but profound spiritual at one moment with the divine root of things must walk in the way of heaven, must follow the dictates of truth and of spirit, and obey the laws of that God, by means of which these good things are to come to him. Failure to do this is to frustrate the purpose. Therefore, we may say that man may build faculties, or he may build integrities. But somewhere along the line, he may build both. Faculties plus integrities constitute true growth. Faculties without integrities mean very little. Therefore, the problem is always that the growth of consciousness comes through the actual uh, growth of the being, the total growth of its resources, its dedication, and conscious devotion to principle. This does not necessarily mean also that these things are accomplished at present. For well, there is much to point out that previous activity through the law of rebirth and karma may bring to the individual in this lifetime something which he cannot perceive to be directly associated with his present actions. Therefore, he may appear to be enjoying privileges that he has not earned or being denied values which he feels are justly his own. All doubts and uncertainties of this nature must themselves be suspended or they will destroy the spiritual achievement that is sought. The individual must accept a lawful universe, earn what is not yet available, and use what is available with the deepest wisdom and understanding that he possesses. Other courses of procedure are dangerous. But out of it all comes this realization that what we call the larger consciousness of man is an involved process of extending known values toward their infinites or toward their ultimate development and growth and of combining with these comparatively unknown factors, all of which combine together uh, to fulfill the ancient admonition, be ye perfect. And in order to attain such a state of perfection, the consciousness of man must increase and extend beyond its present attainment. Well, I think that's all we can do for this time, so we hope to see you again in the near future. Thank you.